Great. Good afternoon. My name is Aurelian Kreyusu, and uh, I'm uh, uh, delighted to introduce Stepan Kolev, uh, our speaker today. Uh, Stepan is a visiting uh, professor, uh, visiting scholar at the Oslo Workshop. He's a professor of political economy at the University of Applied Sciences in Zwickau and the deputy director of the Wilhelm Röpke Institute in Erfurt, Germany. Uh, Stefan is uh, a native of Bulgaria. He earned his PhD in economics from the University of Hamburg. Mm -hmm. And his research is on the intersection between history of economic thought, constitutional political economy, and economic sociology. Stefan also is the co-editor of the Order Yearbook of Economic and Social Order and of the Journal of Contextual Economics, Schmoller's Yearbook. Today's topic is um, uh, one that uh, uh, would be of interest to anyone interested in the political theory side of the Austro workshop. The title of the paper is The Antipathy for Heidelberg, Sympathy for Freiburg, Vincent Ostrom on Max Weber, Walter Eucken, and the Compound History of Order. Um, the format will be the, the regular one for the Monday's uh, colloquia. Stefan will speak for 15 uh, minutes or so. And then there'll be questions following that. I apologize in advance since I did chair one. I'll uh, leave uh, Scott to moderate after I leave. But uh, okay. please join me in welcoming Stefan. So thank you very much for coming. I would like to say a couple of words of gratitude before I start. Uh, of course, institutionally to the workshop, it was an amazing place. So thank you for all, to all the great students, visiting scholars. It was, it really felt like the workshop of the old days, as far as I can reconstruct it from the archives. <laughs> but of course, Aurelian was the greatest host imaginable. Uh, Mike and Dan Cole were sparring partners all the way. <laughs> uh, but last, last but not least, I would like to take Emily and Gail. Emily was very helpful to get me into those archives and to help me with the library and Gail was extremely generous with her time to share memories of Vincent and of his German friends. And Bill, whose class was very helpful to clarify a couple of conundrums which came up, as you will see. So, and let me apologize for the length of the paper, but I got very, I got a fanboy of Vincent, so the <laughs> paper got Okay. Now, my motivation as I presented it in September when we had the round table is that I believe, and so have, when I gave the Tofil lecture, Mike and Aurelian and Dan said, Vincent needs more appreciation because his legacy, as opposed to Jim Buchanan or Lynn Ostrom, has fallen in a sort of a relative disregard. So I hope with that paper, when it's published, that that might, might perhaps change. Pete Betke from GMU, Paul Dragosha and others have been. Uh, great inspiration from all those years, and I shared with that already at the round table that quote by a friend of mine who was here at Visiting Score many years ago, and Vincent told him that it's not only the feel, the room we are sitting in, but also Eucken, which, he, which uh, Vincent sees as the two European foundational traditions. So let's see who that guy Eucken is and what can we make out of that. Now, what I would like to do with that paper is basically to say Vincent never portrayed himself as a historian of economics, but if you read him, um, he appears as somebody who is what I call in the paper an applied historian. Mm -hmm. What has been studied, of course, is his nexus to Hobbes or to Tocqueville, to Montesquieu, but not that many people have written about the German mm -hmm. connection. And I mean, people have referenced it in a number of papers, and it's all in the paper, but it has always been tangential and uh, sort of uh, cursory, so I, I wanted to get into that. My initial quest was, Max Weber, who is my current uh, object uh, of inquiry, gets what I call antipathy in the title, but there is a question mark, as you will see later on, uh, the question mark remains. Whereas Eucken, that German guy, is a sort of a good guy. So I started off uh, in September by asking, why are they good and bad, in what respect, and why? So what I hope to do is to add, as Aurelian said in the introduction, some light to that political theory part of the history of this place, but also to hopefully reconstruct something about the reception of those two Germans in the US, which for a number of different reasons is quite intriguing. <laughs> and uh, I have the link pin today, so I hope the presentation will at some point get us to a Vincent pin, and I hope Pete is watching, he's producing those pins. We can make that happen. Uh, we can make that happen. <laughs> Please do. So this is the pin size. Of this. Okay. 
Now, the problem is that if you know Weber and Eucken as they are read today, they're actually quite similar. So for Vincent, they're like opposites. Today, as I read them, they're not quite in, in harmony, in perfect harmony with each other, it will be then read, but there are many, many similarities. So both of them struggle with theory and history, which we have been discussing in Bill's seminar all the way. So what is the relation between induction and deduction, theory and history, theory and practice? I can call that the great antinomy, so the great antinomy between a theory which is all too general and with empirical work which is far too specific. So how do we resolve that great antinomy? Both of them are extremely interested in epistemology. Both of them see ideal types as the way to resolve um, epistemologic questions or to construct model-like entities which can help to penetrate social reality, as Vincent likes to put it. Of course, institutions, they see society as a set of interdependent orders, and the economy is one of those interdependent orders. Normativity is very important for both. Both die in 1950 out of, out of a sudden, um, quite unexpectedly, and leave an oeuvre legacy, which is really like a torso, which matters, as you will see um, in Eucken's case. What is different, and it also matters for the paper that Weber was not successful in setting up a school, Whereas Eucken set up this fiber school, which for post-war Germany was extremely important for the social market economy, the economic miracle. So in that respect, they were different, and you will see the difference. Now, when I was reading Vincent, who some people in my oral discussions here over the past two months said he's difficult to read and difficult to interpret, I actually found him very clear, perhaps because I've spent the last 12 years reading German stuff. Uh, so in comparison, it was completely clear. But I, I, I increasingly felt, I, I, I felt that those 12 years have given me a set of keys, perhaps, or codes uh, to decode some stuff. So what I felt is that I'm interested in him as an applied historian. I'll speak about that in a second. Somebody who is interested in complexity and captures that complexity through those notions of institutions and orders. And somebody who is very interested in epistemology, so in understanding what do we know, how do we know, what is the role of the scholar, what is the role of the citizen, how do they interact, to really not only explain um, social interactions, but also understand in the Max Weber sense of first day. So to put yourself into the shoes of those people who you're actually trying to study. While I was working in the library or in the library or mostly in the library, so it's a great space. I thought he has developed three techniques. Um, the first technique is that whenever he gets into an author, for example, to kill a form not not that knowledgeable, or like Professor Feyut, so he sort of dissects that guy, uh, his arguments, into fragments. And those fragments become what I call in a paper like the characters in an alphabet. So then can be employed very generally for all types of purposes. To give you an example, he so Vincent has one of those tons of archival papers never published, and one is presented, as you will see, in the, in the Austrian Alps. He uses the same fragment the year later in Nigeria to explain to the Nigerians how to improve their institutional framework. So quite different audiences, quite different workshops, uh, conferences, but the very same fragment with, however, tiny variations. So I call that a theme with variation, like in music. So you have to be very careful how to read it, but the theme is recognizable. What is also important, I call it, in, I call it enclosed sediments. So he gets into an author, for example, Weber in the 1960s. He reads him as a bureaucracy theorist, which is the way Weber is read out of those very eclectic translation volumes in the 1950s and 60s, or 40s and 50s, but Vincent reads them in the 50s and 60s. But then, when he's done with an author, he encloses that like it's a, his authors are like sediments in a river. And when he's done with an author, he's done with an author. So he doesn't keep reading the secondary literature or in the case of Weber, uh, the forthcoming uh, publication. So Weber left behind, as I said, a torso, completely incomprehensible as of 1920. Today, the complete editions are still not finished. They should be finished next year, 100th anniversary of his death, and there are 50 volumes of that size. Vincent wouldn't care. He got what he got out of Weber, period. So these are the three techniques which I envisioned. I've never thought of those terms. 
until I became the fanboy of Vincent, but I think I captured quite well the way he employs and applies um, history. Now, what Weber is, is quite clear from the published uh, writings, those recurrent themes and variations. So in Hayek's notions, he's only about taxes, so about that simple designed orders, specifically the bureaucratic order. Actually, Vincent takes from Weber explicitly the term monocratic, so there is one person in charge. And then the bureaucracy is um, um, a perfect hierarchy out of that one center of power. And that's it. He realizes that Weber is a, has a positive analysis. There is nothing normative about it, but um, he has been captured, as Vincent reads it, uh, by normative quests like Woodrow Wilson and Wilsonians later on, who take Weber as um, a very clear argument which fortifies their normative quest to disband US federalism. Curiously, and that was one of Bill's helps, we read Herbert Simon in the seminar, and um, and Vincent says there was very bad timing when those translations of Weber in the 40s and 50s were published, because those were the same years when Herbert Simon published his super heavy challenge to the Wilsonian project. But Weber was used as a weapon to sort of counter that Simon challenge, right? Okay, but that's basically the story of Weber. There is nothing in the archives which is of interest. Here things are much more curious, so there is a big question mark. There is an Eukens challenge as it pops up into in Mike's volumes, in Barbara's volumes. What is that? What is that? Well, what is that means you need to go to the archives. I did. I spent the last six weeks or so in the archives. The Lilly Library is a wonderful place. I was very fortunate that they closed in a week uh, for renovation, um, <laughs> but they were very helpful. Now, the problem is that the finding aid is combined on both Lynn and Vincent. It's 800 pages. We have 400 boxes. Each box has roughly 12, 20 folders. The, the finding aid is well done, but as you will see in the final slides, not quite perfect, but, but it's very well done. So I was very grateful to work with it. The problem is that regardless if you go to the digital library of the commons or to the finding aid, you get no hits, hardly any. Well, but there were helpful people here, people like Bill, Barbara. So we had the reception after uh, Barbara's movie. And so on the same day, Bill mentioned Bielefeld. Think about Bielefeld. Well, it's not quite Bill's Bielefeld because that was in the late 80s. But on the same day when we were walking back from the marker ceremony, I bumped into that paper and I see Bielefeld. Well, there is a joke in German, the city of Bielefeld does not exist. But it does exist, right? So I bump into that paper, and I start reading the paper, and I bump into something here. Nobody would care about Radain. Well, I do. <laughs> this is a very traditional seminar, which was founded in the 60s. Radain is a small village in, the, in southern Tyrol, so today's Italy, former Austria. And Vincent went there. I was amazed. How did Vincent go into the Austrian Alps? Well, he didn't just go into the Austrian Alps. This paper is not published. It's published in a tiny, tiny, tiny version in an Italian journal. But this paper is 59 pages long, and I started reading. Well, and I kept reading. So after 100, uh, 1,400 pictures in the archives, I got into wonderful correspondence, which is in detail in the paper, between him and two Germans. Well, many more Germans, but two interesting ones. The one is a guy at Marburg. If you go upstairs, uh, at the library, and you see the memorabilia, there is a wonderful picture of Marburg. So one of uh, Germany's oldest universities, most in, one of the most important universities. But there is no Freiburg, right? So my Freiburg quest in the title got me almost nowhere. <laughs> um, now, as you can see, the letter is in German. So Gustav uh, Berg is somebody who Vincent Smith at the first Bielefeld year in 81-82, which is formative for both Vincent and for, Vin, uh, for both Vincent and Lynn. Lynn starts, so immediately afterwards, the AID framework is published in 82. And Vincent got two good friends. One is this uh, Hans Günther Kusselberg. Unfortunately, he passed away last year. I knew him a bit, but now I cannot talk to him anymore. The papers are awesome, and Vincent says, please write me in German. And I will reply in English. And Vincent starts learning German, taking lessons here in Bloomington in 81. You will see that in a minute. Um, and the correspondence is extensive. There are about 70 letters going back and forth. It's all the 1980s. 
the other guy, so this is a, a letter from Vincent um, saying that blah, blah, there's Anna Zetten, the only German who got a Nobel Prize in economics, very important for Lynn. And this is the other guy, he's a sociologist, I didn't know I have to say, but Barbara mentioned that at the reception, uh, Franz Xaver Kaufmann, never heard of. Uh, I just sent him the paper yesterday because I didn't want to be biased by what he has to tell me. So let's see what he says about the paper, he's still alive. Um, <coughs> there is a gigantic volume upstairs which probably nobody knows, but it's a very curious one and it's the same publisher as my thesis. Um, Vincent, Trusselberg and Kaufmann and uh, another guy uh, have a volume out of that first Bielefeld here. It's called Guidance, Economic Control, performance, something. Yeah. Performance, yeah. Uh -huh. Guidance, performance. Yes. Um, that works it right. So out of this correspondence, I keep reading and reading and reading. I found curious things like that. Hansa. What was Hansa? Well, perhaps an old Hansa and Kegel is a fairy tale, but, <laughs> but, but no, this is another Hansa. So this is a student of Eucken. Now, who would care? I do. Um, and th those are all those traces who got me going. So Vincent didn't have Eucken, as I now know, until 88, 89. So he was sent by the Kusselberg guy, who was a so Hensel was, was at Marburg. So Kusselberg sends Vincent a small book by Hensel. And Vincent reads, start learning German. So you see here, Ordnung, Bildung, Wissen, Umwelt. Even more painfully, uh, he, there is a paper upstairs in the library, which is 30 pages long, from this Radein conference in 87, where Vincent went. So you see on, if you see every page, you see on any term, uh, the, the English translation. So he's painfully, painfully, painfully doing it. Why is he doing that? Well, he does that because I see Eucken, this tradition to which Hensel belongs, to which Puzzlebeth belongs, as the last love affair of Vincent's life in the sense of his intellectual uh, engagement with intellectual history. And in, in 87, he really gets super enthusiastic. So there is a, this is a memo written in Radein, very long. He says, we need to do something. So in 1989, we would have 50 years of Eucken's foundations. We need to publish them in English. Well, they were published in English, but he didn't know. 1950. So, 1950, but the Germans didn't care, unfortunately. <laughs> he did. Um, but unfortunately, so this was perhaps a tiny footnote, um, sort of a tragedy is that when I came to the library upstairs, I thought, wow, I will work with his books. Unfortunately, the books upstairs are almost unused because after they passed away, the, their private library, where I would find all those volumes, has been disbanded. So um, I couldn't find the, the works, the, the books he was really working with, right? Mm -hmm. So he says, we need to translate. We need to set up a Liberty Fund conference in Bloomington. We need to found a community of sociologists, anthropologists, economists, who have, who have some, something to say about this uh, Oiken challenge. We need to publish and translate, uh, super enthusiastic. Now, as of last Monday, and if that's how the paper ends, it basically ends into nothing, um, because he gets ill. They keep inviting him to go to Rodin, he couldn't make it. Okay, but last week, after I finished the paper, I kept going to the archives because I have some additional stuff to scan. I was interested in Hans Eilert, who was a very important German philosopher, a very important Popperian, and I was looking at Albert. Well, Albert got me to Freiburg. Why? Um, in 2006, and I know that, I knew that I was desperate to find that file, but no way. They wait. They went to Freiburg. I was a PhD student. I will tell, I will tell that in a minute. And Hans Albert, when I was looking for Albert, I bumped into a file which is only catalogued as Albert Ludwigs Universität, which is the long name of Freiburg, but no Freiburg in the catalog. Mm -hmm. And this is lovely because, and I'm coming to the end now, um, they went to Freiburg to the Eucken Institute, very good friends of mine. Um, they were giving, so Lynn was a professor, a visiting professor for a whole semester. They gave a, so the folder is that big, I haven't quite scanned it yet but it's full of graduate student papers. So it was a spring school, some summer school, but in the spring. And Lynn has this lovely um, habit of producing for every trip. I mean, I scanned quite a few of her trips. She produces, in the end, sort of a report, a note to self, right?
uh, to remember all the mm. people, and, and the report is low. <laughs> so you see two elderly uh, scholars, and Vincent being very, very happy to have finally made it to that place when going to the Black Forest and uh, eating uh, cakes and stuff like that. But they finally, finally made it. And you see that Oiken's challenge. So in the end, I did find that happy end as opposed to what he did in the paper that it ended into nothing. So let me conclude. Um, what I believe happened is, and I, and I think it matters, um, that will be the way I conclude. Um, what I believe happened is that he bumped into this tradition of Eucken. He wrestled with it. He, he, he wanted to learn German to, 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 to get into it. He, I don't think he learned French to, to get into a field in the original. But here, he wanted to get into Why? The very brief version would be that I think he, and these are the dimensions which I identify, he basically, as I see, self-identified with that tradition. You can find in the correspondence stuff where he says, it's amazing they're like myself. So those Germans, the tradition, so they think that the way I think, they write in German, but I understand it. So what is it? They care about complex social orders, not just the taxes. They're very um, keen to, to, to grasp epistemology. Frameworks as opposed to models, just class. Uh, and those frameworks had to be on different levels and talky, so not just uh, what Hans Albert called model platonism. So you had one model and you try to, uh, to capture everything. Economics is a science of self organization, basically about polycentricity. Um, you need the framework. Without frameworks, the self organization doesn't work. The economy is a set within interdependent societal orders. It's very helpful for comparative analysis. So, he, so the guy Hensel I mentioned, is all the way about comparative economic systems. So Vincent says we need to take that and to use that for comparative political systems. Last but not least, this cannot be achieved neither by Oiken nor by Weber nor by Vincent, but it must be achieved in large communities of multidisciplinary people working together from all kinds of fields. Why does it matter? Um, it matters because I believe if he had bumped into that in the 70s, as opposed to that very last decade when he was active. It might be, I mean, as a historian, I shouldn't pose this as if question or what if. Um, but I think it might be that if he had understood that this type of economics, as he bumps into it here, and connects it to Hayek and Lachman and all kinds of people, it's all in the paper, it might be that his notion of police simplicity, which he points very early, but that is quite dormant mm -hmm. over time, could have really become, could have really received a major impulse to um, to get deeper on that, as opposed to again that dormant concept, which has been, of course, used by Lin and others, but not so much by Vincent. So I believe it could have a, a decade earlier that infatuation with the tradition could have really been extremely productive to him. Let me conclude with a final personal line. Um, I knew about the Freiburg Summer School. A friend of mine told me in Hamburg. I said, okay. <coughs> I'll go there, he said, there with his friends, there with your friends, so go there. I, I enrolled, I got very ill, and I didn't make it. That was the first time I heard the Ostrom's name. Uh, but after those weeks um, in the archives, I have to say, I feel a little bit proud and very happy that at least indirectly now I could get it working. Thank you. Thank you. take uh, questions uh, based on your presentation, but also the text that was circulated. Uh, any students in the room who want to ask uh, first? Mike. Why student of human conditions. We're, we're all students. <laughs> we're all students. <laughs> student of human condition. <laughs> uh, Stefan, I'm, I'm flabbergasted how much sense you've made out of some of the papers of Vincent mm -hmm. that I've stayed far away from. Thank you. I read a lot of his works, but I could never sort of get through these sorts of things. Well, I'd like to you know follow up a little bit on what you just concluded there at the end, because uh, that was one of the things I was sort of. That tradition has continued since uh, Vincent was done with it, or in 2006, the visit. Uh, and Vince, by 2006, Vincent was was very much a shadow of his 
his former um, uh, ability. What within that tradition has happened in the German tradition, in the German tradition that you think could have really had an impact on the way Vincent okay. looked at polycentricity and how yep. he might have articulated that okay. in other places? So this is very helpful. In the German tradition, so that Freiburg School has a, we were discussing that yesterday at night uh, with some wine, um, it ended very unfortunate. The Freiburg School was very important in the 30s and 40s. But Eucken died in 1950 when delivering a lecture series at LSE upon Hayek's invitation. So he gets a heart attack on top of a pneumonia and passes away. His important student dies a couple of months later. His most famous student, Friedrich Lutz, who made a great career in Princeton, was invited to go to Freiburg, but got an offer from Zurich. So the school didn't actually move on. What Vincent calls the Marburg School, and I know quite a few of those elderly uh, gentlemen, and I greatly respect them, but, and this is the problem, and this is why those chairs don't exist anymore. Unfortunately, they were more keen to preserve the tradition as a museo type of artifact, mm -hmm. as opposed to creatively uh, develop it. So unlike the Austrian school, which started 150 years ago, and people are still right. doing pretty original work, uh, which is quite unique in history economics anyway, right? So the Freiburg school didn't quite move on. I think my generation tries not to do something, but they will be immodest to claim them. So I don't think um, the further developments from the 80s, 90s, or 2000s will be important, but what would be important and I really want to, so I'll be giving that talk on, at Liberty Fund on Wednesday in Indianapolis. And mm -hmm. what I would be very interested in, so we finally, finally, finally now are doing the complete works of Eucken. So not the collected works, but really sort of the complete works. And the second book of Eucken, which I think would have been immensely interesting to Vincent, but he never got it, is called Principle of Econ Principles of Economics. It has never been translated as a full book. It only, we only have fragments uh, every, mm -hmm. or scattered in the literature. So I think, and I really, uh, I really talked to, to my friends at Liberty Fund that we, we need to translate that book. So I think if he, had, if he had had that one, he would then start combining it. He starts combining in the papers already, right? So he says, hmm, this is combinable with Hayek. It gives me another reading of Hayek. It's combinable with Lachma. Sorry for dropping those names, which probably some of you are not so important, but so I think he understood that this is an institutionalized version of some of the Austrian stuff, which sometimes can be read as deinstitutionalized. Mm -hmm. So I think if he had had a second book in English, and if he had had more of his active years, that would have been enough. So that if he had been around, if he had gotten to know this earlier, yep. and had read that book in German, you think that would have had a big impact on how he made connections to Hayek in, in and, the Austrian school. And, and again, develop his own polycentricity notion. So I see economics as a science of exchange, as a science of decentralized power, as a science of, um, Hayek calls it, catalactics. All that is very, very close to polycentricity. And so I think he could have used that fountain, which he saw as a fountain, to get deeper on policy. I'd like to build up on, on the, uh, take the prerogative of the moderator here. Well, this question uh, is, is of interest to me as well. So in the beginning of the Oiken 1940 book, he talks about the economic constitution mm -hmm. um, in the chapter on stages and styles of economic development. Yes. And he writes this, by economic constitution we mean the decision as to the general ordering of the economic life of a community. And he yes. talks about partial constitutions. I do think that Vincent did have that intuition yes. in his work. I, wa I was wondering whether he actually uh, yes. does work with it. Also in the same chapter in Oikan, you have uh, 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 an excerpt on the rules of the game, the yes. importance of the rules of the game that are clearly outlined. And finally, uh, Oikan had that intuition about the importance of not to simplify key concepts. For example, on page 89 of the book, he writes a term like free market economy is a crude simplification which is unsuitable as a description, because it tells us nothing about the formative elements in the economic system of the time. So I think that, that, that Vincent did work 
in, uh, with this. So I think he had all of, all of the right places uh, I agree. in mind. I agree. But if you take that first book, which is upstairs in English, mm -hmm. translated upon Hayek's intermediation in the late 40s and published in 1951 by Chicago, then the second. The second book is what you just mentioned is completely different, right? So it gets you intuitions, but the second book gets you depth. It's 200. The 52. The 52 book. It's a posthumous book called Principle of, Econ Principles of Economics, and it really is about economic policy, the principles of economic policy. And it's all about constitutionalism, as you said. It's all about. Um, so this is more of a methodological book. Mm. So it resonates with Vincent, the, yeah. the, the epistemologist. This book would have resonated, the other book would have resonated with Vincent, the constitutional. Let me say, I, I put that picture briefly back. I had some conversations with Jim Buchanan on that same topic in um, 2008, 2012. Week. He came to, a, to, an annual, to an annual summer institute every year. And he knew, and of course Vincent and Jim mm -hmm. were good friends. So, um, and there is correspondence also, uh, not only with Buchanan, which I've had a look at, but also with Victor Van Berg. So they did talk about that. But again, it would have been more an than an intuition. He understands what, it, what is crucial is what you last mentioned, those words, notions, terms, right? So he says, given that epistemological interest in concepts, he says, simple concepts is not getting, are not getting us anywhere. But again, the constitutionalism, which, so auto-liberalism is about constitutions, the economic constitution, the constitution of the state. So that would have really, really perhaps pushed him to publish yet another edition of the Compound Republic or something like yes. that. Right. Good. Bill. Uh, I'm just going to take what uh, Mike and Aurelian have already posed and just ask a somewhat more specific variation of it. I'm going to go back to your, uh, despite being a historian and not wanting to engage in as ifs, the as if or what if. Um, um, if Vincent had engaged more fully with the German work, especially what you can say in the 1970s, mm -hmm. how do you think it would have uh, might have affected the relationship with um, the public choice stuff? Yeah. Uh, your paper references to yep. uh, the fact that later in their careers, you know, they kind of drew apart from yep. and drew some criticism from uh, public choice scholars. I wonder how closely the bond with college public choice scholars might ever have even yep. been uh, been formed. So I'm very grateful for this question, as in for any question. So we always make fun of the Romanians. So we should be. We should not discriminate and, and say that their help question was not helpful. <laughs> but uh, you know, I'm very grateful for this one because uh, out of the Eucken Institute, Victor Van Berg talking to Buchanan, I've thought quite a bit about that in that other context. So, as you said, I mentioned in the paper, although I have to get deeper into that, and uh, Mike and I were talking at lunch about that. So this sort of slow, friendly divorce from the public choice society, right? I think, connecting to Aurelian's question, I think what could have happened is what Buchanan actually did. So Buchanan, um, in the 80s, said, okay, enough of public choice. It has some dangerous implications, getting nihilistic about politics. So he set up constitutional political economy as his last research program, which not that many people in the public choice crowd liked. So it could be very much in that same pattern that Vincent would have said, public choice guys, you're doing dangerous stuff. You're not serious about epistemology, as he was always saying. But again, this is a helpful question to sort of help me make my point. That could have made him, in Jim's trajectory, um, to set up something similar, yeah. his own constitutional political economy. Mm -hmm. So Barbara says in, in the preface to the final edition of the Compound Republic that he was not willing to publish the book all until the late 80s, and even then it was with Nebraska and stuff like that, right? So, um, and I got the first edition sent here as an antiquarian. Uh, it's so lovely, right? And it has, in the first edition, which was published apocryphically by, the, by Virginia Tech, right. so it's very difficult to get, it has a tiny line which says, to Jim, who challenged, mm. right? So that's the dedication. I have it upstairs uh, in my personal pilot books. Yeah. So um, 
so that I think, so that discourse with Buchanan, who was also disenchanted with some of public choice, could have made Vincent move on a similar trajectory, perhaps. Uh, we have uh, Dean. Yep. Yeah. So, Stefan, for regular economists who don't read uh, Sorry. <laughs> history of thought stuff and so forth, uh, yeah, there's, there's many questions, but could you maybe clarify uh, in a modern context so where we fit uh, Vincent um, in this political, in this public choice versus constitutional economics debate, and even the modern theory of bureaucracy, let's say. I mean, there's many, many applications, but just to give some mm -hmm. some context, I find it hard, hard yep. to, uh, to, to pull things out of this um, for my application. Okay. So um, let me again use Bill and our class, which quite a few in the room are attending. So we are reading uh, Lynn's 2005 book, Understanding Institutional Diversity, which to me has been a, and this is not a compliment or blah, blah, blah. This, this is an amazing book. I didn't know it so far, and you only knew earlier publications. So if you read that book, and I think this can help me answer your question, you understand that what she was doing, but of course building up upon Vincent's uh, inspirations, also explicitly in the book, is all about a general theory of institutions. Now that sounds a bit like a grand theory, so uh, immodest and not very humble, but the book is very humble. So I think what they were trying to do um, as a team, and Vincent on perhaps some different level, is simply that. So to set up a theory which helps you deal with collective choice issues, but then already in the 70s he says con the constitutional level of collective choice issues is different than the usual collective choice. So we need to get serious about those different levels. It's all about institutions, but the institution, the, the nature of those institutions is different. The mode of decision making is of course different, uh, unanimity and things like that. Um, we should be able not only to talk about the political constitution, but the rules of the game in all kinds of sets, right? It could be the rules of the game in science as in Polanyi, who is a major inspiration to, to, to anybody. Could be the rules of the game in the economy, like regulation. It could be about the rules of the game in, the, uh, in democracies. It could be about the rules of the game even in religion, the covenant, right? So it's just that, just that, right? So it's about thinking the rules of the game within which free individuals are free to play the moves of the game. And the better the rules of the game are, the more self-sustained and self-organizing the processes are within those rules. So the better we play our games, as understood from game theory. By the way, game theory, as it was conceived in 44, is also connected to that because Morkenstern was part of that Austrian crowd in Vienna. So it's all um, that notion that we play games in society, all kinds of games. This games of game of science is different than the game of religion, but we can conceptualize them in games. But it's helpful in all those games to distinguish the moves from the rules and to see who is in charge of what. So I think that is the quest, basically, as I see it. Okay, you? Yeah. Yeah. Stefan, I hope it was compatible with normal economist slang. I'm, I'm a very normal economist, as you know, but uh, I, I got... Uh, we welcome all types of I, got a, I, took, I took a detour a couple of years ago. Uh, okay, yeah. Yes, Stefan, I'm really amazed um, and, and humbled by this wonderful paper you Thank put you. out. Yes. Yeah. Both by the insights that you revealed mm -hmm. and also the, the way you, you delved into these archives. Thank and, you. Um, very good uh, example for me to learn as well. Um, Archives are wonderful. In case you haven't done archival work, and when Lily reopens next year, go there. It's an amazing place. By the way, they have fantastic stuff. Uh, Ruta was amazed on Facebook that they have like a Gutenberg Bible and all mm -hmm. kinds of things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing place, and anybody can work there. So it's right. not a there is not, no, nothing limited about right. it. So archives are lovely. <laughs> there, there was a picture the other day. They're processing Lynn's pictures. There is 
tons of pictures, but one is with Obama. So you see even yeah. that uh, kinds of things. Yeah. So, so my question is, as I was reading also like the, the per kind of personal history of of Weber and you can, mm -hmm. I I couldn't help but wonder the the context that they lived in, mm -hmm. and so I, I was wondering whether in addition to you can being uh, you can uh, book being and and ideas being translated mm -hmm. or brought in, into um, Vincent's attention much later. Yep. Uh, do you think it had to do perhaps with uh, the the changes in <clears throat> in, the, in the global political uh, sphere in terms of you know the the Soviets coming yep. in in a downturn and uh, do you think it, this might have shifted Vincent's uh, attention to Yugen's literature? This is very helpful mm -hmm. question. Very very helpful both for today's relevance and all that, and for his, the historical exercise. Now, concerning the historical exercise, and Mike agreed with that when we, have, when we were talking at lunch, Vincent doesn't really care too much about the time of a historical figure. Mm -hmm. So he would not care too much about Tocqueville's France or Tocqueville's uh, America or stuff like that. But, and your question is very important, but, um, those notions of frameworks, so thinking about frameworks and not only about the process, or so economists do in game theories, we think about the game. But when, what are the moments in history where we should also think about the rules, so about the framework? Now the moments in history where we should think about, especially and focusedly think about framework, are moments of fragility. So when frameworks fall apart and there is a window of opportunity, as we were just discussing last week or the week before, to reconstruct them. And of course, tragically, in the 30s and 40s, everything was falling apart. The world economy was falling apart. Europe was more than falling apart. So in those moments, you think of frameworks. Now, Vincent, in the second edition of the intellect, uh, Tommy has the third edition, and the prefaces are all in it. In the, in the intellectual crisis, there is a second edition, which is not really a second edition, but sort of a reprint with a tiny, small preface because of the Nixon crisis. Right. Mm -hmm. And so he says, oops, you see, this country is now in a moment where we should think fundamentally about that, he calls it crypto imperialism and the presidential, yeah. um, how is it called, presidential? Imperial presidency. Presidency. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in those moments, we should think about it. And now, coming to today's world, today, unfortunately, this is my last. Uh, you of Professor Kravitz, so uh, <laughs> see you soon on <laughs> Skype. He's leaving to, uh, to Europe uh, the next day. So, okay. so thank you. Um, so today, I shared in the seminar my notion that Donald Trump is a stress test for the institutions uh, of the US and uh, elsewhere. So again, we are in a world where the WTO is a part of like, it threatened where we don't know about NATO, we don't know about the European Union. So in those years, again, unfortunately, I wouldn't compare them to the 30s and 40s, of course, yeah. but the notion of fragility makes our time again worthwhile thinking of mm -hmm. that stuff. And uh, in a paper which I'll be giving tomorrow at Ball State uh, University, um, which is completely different, um, um, I have a, I have I'll send you the paper. Um, there is now the so-called order liberal renaissance, as I call it. So there is a huge literature which came out over the past five years in, in the best presses, Princeton, Oxford, um, anywhere. Because uh, some historians and political scientists uh, said, OK, the euro crisis, as it was handled by Germany, is very different uh, from, the, from other responses to the euro crisis. What is going to happen with the euro? And out of that, they said, is that response to fiscal policy and monetary policy from Germany different from France or Italy, mm -hmm. is that a result of that legacy? Mm -hmm. Perhaps it is. I'm skeptical, mm -hmm. but there is a wonderful Routledge volume upstairs, I can give it to you, which says, well, there are some, perhaps, links. So unfortunately, I think we live again in times where, because frameworks fall apart, we need to think of them as cowards, as artisans, as Vincent would say, mm -hmm. but there is also, on the more positive side, a way to shape them. In the 70s and 80s, where when, let's say, somebody like Friedman was important, the framework was so super stable. Nobody thought the wall would fall, mm. the Berlin Wall. So in those, in those moments, 
it's a pure intellectual game to think about reshaping constitutions and all that, right? But when the wall fell, I was eight, I was in Bulgaria, so I've lived all the way the 90s through a time where everything was fundamentally reconstituted, <laughs> right? I don't hope, I don't hope that the West is getting there now. But again, we ever since 2016, the Brexit and the Trump election, we, we have that sense of, Frank Knight would say, fundamental uncertainty, right? Thank you so much. Tony? This I, yes, I have, this was really really nicely written, by the way, for a first draft. I thought it was amazing. Um, so I, I had this question about this um, kind of the the idea of kind of enclosed sentiments, right? Yep. Um, so I I've, I've been flipping through a couple of the PDFs of of the Ostroms. Mm -hmm. So this idea of Oiken being so influential on, especially Vincent. The late Vincent. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned that he, when he's done with an author, he kind of shelves them. But yet there are some that appear in a lot of his texts, Tocqueville and Hobbes and, and Wilson, yep. always are there. But they appear the same. Yeah, that, I guess that's what I'm wondering. Why do, so he always like, he just kind of keeps them around as, he so said, what's the difference between, I guess, those versus okay. Waken? So the difference, mm -hmm. so those are people he read. And he would finish reading and mm -hmm. in his private house, which I've of course never seen, he would just use the same, same, same Definitely. references from the same, same volumes all the way. Here he knew people. So they were sending him books. They were talking to him in letters. They were meeting in Europe a couple of times, not only Rodin. They were meeting all the way. So they yeah. were in Bloomington. He would be in Marburg, uh, in Bielefeld, tons of times. So it was a conversation. That's why I said here that a big difference between Weber and Eucken is Eucken found in the school. Weber didn't. So those were life conversations. And because of that, I think the sediment closed, as I put it in the paper, by, let's say, 1990. But it took much longer to close because they kept pushing him. But he also, again, with his memo and stuff like that, he kept pushing them. So, it was, and it's, so the letters are extremely personal. So those are families who are great friends. It's not just the scholars. Right? Yeah. So this is really, um, since I've read lots and lots and lots of correspondence over the past 10 years, you can clearly distinguish correspondence which is purely professional mm -hmm. and correspondence which has very personal connotations. So here it's really about friendship, yeah. as the workshop yeah. tradition mm -hmm. would. So I'm sorry, I don't think I maybe phrase that correctly. Why does then, to phrase it different, why doesn't he cite Oiken more? He cites him quite a bit. So I'm looking at some of his stuff. And no, some of the, I mean, I've, so I have all references to Oiken <laughs> in the paper. It's scattered, right? But it's quite a bit, and it gets very late, and so he doesn't quote always Eucken. So you need to uh, control F um, for Ordnungstheorie. So if you put that, okay. you bump into many, many, many hits, because again he was reading Hensel and Gretel. Um, so um, this book, nobody knows about that book. It's, it's a nice book about comparative economic systems. So if you go for Hensel, you'll get more hits. Mm -hmm. um, so then, right, but again, Ordnung's theory is something which pops up, pops up uh, quite, quite a bit. Okay. And as Mike said, I don't know about the 80s, right, but uh, there were moments of good health and bad health. Yeah. And in those unpublished papers, so I have a plan um, with, to, to publish two of them in the Review of Austrian Economics, one very small and that very long paper, which had never been published in that length, in the unpublished papers, there is also quite a bit in addition to what is visible. Mm -hmm. But the visible stuff is quite a lot. I mean, um, yeah, I'm just, yeah, I've only looked at like five or six, and I know your paper contains more, but yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah, I'll, I'll show you the section afterwards. Yeah, it's, um, I see your paper too. I've seen, yeah. It's, um, I think, given that it's only pops pops up in the mid '80s, and it goes until the early '90s, but so in that, in that section, which was the real love affair, yeah. there are quite a few. And the paper, so this paper here, uh, the Bielefeld paper, paper. Yeah. it's the 50, I sent it to Mike, right? So, and it's online, by the way, it's, it's, a, it's in the digital library. It's 50 da -da -da pages, single space, uh, yeah. and it's uh, not all about that stuff, but it's framed, again, the themes and variations. Uh, you have lots of Tocqueville and Hobbes and stuff like that, but it's contained and framed within that, so it begins like page-wise, a 
about Hansel and Eucken and right. And again, let me perhaps I was very brief with that. So here, if you read that memo, I'll send you the memo. He says we need at the workshop to start doing that here. He hmm. wants the book to be translated by Liberty Fund. He wants to have a Liberty Fund conference here. He wants sort of the way the workshop works, he says, is the only way how this challenge can be resolved. So we should institutionalize Marburg and Bloomington. And the Marburg people are also, uh, they like that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, this here is uh, Deutsche Volksgemeinschaft is the national, how do you call it here? National, not the humanities, but the big one. Uh, the NSF? No, no, no. 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 The National Science Foundation. Yes, so this is the, that's the German equivalent. Yeah. They're thinking of setting up grant proposals for all that. So this is really about not just translating a book, but setting up a scholarly community, which I don't know how people think when they're 70, but uh, so to, to keep on working on that, right? So there is, so when I started with all that, I knew the references in the literature, so a lot of people, how they re refer to that connection, and it's not very intriguing. But the archival stuff is really, it shows genuine, I would say, enthusiasm, mm -hmm. not a cursory mention, right? And uh, again, I will, I'll send you this memo. I think it's really enough. It goes four or five pages, like that single space type, and it's all about organizational measures. So short-term measures, long-term measures, how do we make Oiken come to the US? We have a few more minutes left yeah, sure. before we need to wrap up. There's we have to talk more about, about that Liberty Fund conference too, but that's interesting. Yeah. I'll talk to other, them. Other, uh, uh, yes, please. Oh, I'm going to a Liberty Fund conference on Thursday on Mount Faber in North Carolina. Okay. So I'll catch up after. I have yeah. Uh, yeah. quite a few days to try to yeah. get them enthusiastic. Um, I remember you bemoaning the lack of intellectual history mm -hmm. being taught in uh, graduate economics programs. Mm -hmm. And I have to say this, uh, first couple of chapters are really, really mm -hmm. helpful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I learned a lot from them, and they're, they're just beautifully written, a lot of fun new metaphors. And just um, and also, I think, just in terms of accessibility, um, or just the, the, the relevance in it, you do you know, bring it back to current terminology mm -hmm. in, 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 in economics. And I think that um, I enjoy it so much because I think these quite, there is a bit of you know, self-similarity all the way on down. And so when you're thinking of uh, some of these bigger questions um, and the modeling decisions related to them, uh, even when you're looking in the realm of you know, regular economics, mm -hmm. that uh, you face very similar sort of trade-offs and stuff. And epistemology issues are all very relevant. So uh, for my own you know, narrow work, <laughs> I found it very instructive to read these couple of chapters. And, yeah. um, and I can see how it relates, you know, not just to, to your project there, but also they're just really insightful. But I don't know whether this sort of stuff is um, how it is uh, distributed more generally to people. But I really enjoyed that. I think you read some more stuff than that. Uh, thank you, Rick. So uh, perhaps an insider that his father was a major historian, so he's not oh, only yeah. a you know, <laughs> he's not only a simple economist working in the business school. Uh, but so no. But thank you for the compliment and let me let me it's follow up. So that's the context. You always need context. Yeah, people ask questions. And this is next one. I feel like you're like you you so you're saying even though I'm an economist, you know, I still you know speak I, oh, great compliment. Okay, all right. Already and said I should I should uh, already said I should order the book of your father and it's on my bucket list. So uh, I always not wanted to know about Teddy Roosevelt. Um, no, let me put it like that. You had something very important. I I, I believe it's a tragedy. That economics, um, and I don't. I would like to hear also Dean's opinion about that. That economics, as it's taught, not so much perhaps on the graduate level, but really on the undergrad level, mm -hmm. has been so dehistoricized. Mm -hmm. I believe that. So I teach at an engineering university in a business school, but also at many other institutions like PPE type of institutions all over Germany or in Prague. And my sense is, when I teach undergrads, if they get exposed to history economics early on, mm -hmm. they fall in love with economics. They realize what cool people have written on economics. Mm -hmm. They realize that it's an intellectual endeavor as opposed to applied physics. They realize that they can solve social problems as opposed to analysis mm -hmm. and algebra. 
they realize really the beauty, the intellectual sex appeal of this discipline by a tiny course as undergrads. And don't jump off to sociology, political science, law, or whatever, because they are pissed off by uh, the Samuelsonian type of textbooks, which we still use on the undergrad level. So I really think for very pragmatic reasons, because in, at least in Germany, the econ students' numbers are going down, for very pragmatic reasons, I think a course early on in history would be helpful, and I think on top, a course on methodology in very simple terms would be helpful to make students more sensitive and critical to all those canons, mm -hmm. in the sense of ballistic canons of empirical methods they get, they get uh, confronted with, so to get more critical in a, in a helpful way of statistics and econometrics as well, and what is theory as opposed to mm -hmm. statistics and what is calibration and what is estimation, so I think history and methodology would make them just appreciate the subject on a very, very different level. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, I mean, I, mean I, I agree with you. I mean, there's a lot to be critical of STEM, undergraduate economic education, but the, the problem really lies high. There's almost no one who can teach such a course in actual faculties. So that is, there is a good development. I mean, there, so we don't have an economic history course here, for example. And you know, most, the, the market for economic historians is shrinking fast. Um, so it'd be hard, and, and you can't get someone who does micro theory to teach an economic history course. You could, but it, it wouldn't fly. So there's, there's a there's a problem. I have two replies. I have two replies to that. So first of all, when the when the Great Recession hit in ten years ago, I was very helpful that it would help history of economics my field. It didn't, yeah. but it did help economic history. So economic history, as I see it, has had quite a bit of a comeback, right? So I hope, <laughs> smiley, we are heading now in the next recession. So it might be, <laughs> and in eco economists sure. will yet again not have seen it. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so I hope that now we might, no, this is like a more funny reply, but, but again, economic history was dead 12, 15 years ago. And now I see that it's very quantitative, of course, but it has fortunately, 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 has had a comeback. My more serious reply is this. So I'm moving in two weeks to Duke for the next three months of my sabbatical, and they have, for example, a very nice program every summer now for about 10 years, and before the conference, the summer school where I was meeting Buchanan, all of those summer schools are dedicated precisely to laymen um, who have some intuitive interest in history so that they can teach history right, funded by the, by the um, uh, Endowment for the Humanities. Mm -hmm. the National Endowment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so there is something going on. And I mean, Duke is the only place which does it like, there is a center of history political economy where I'll be. But there are some, if you go to the History of Economic Society uh, meeting, which I do every year, it was at Columbia this year, last year in Chicago, there is a crowd which is growing. It's even young people. Ten years ago, when I joined, no young people. Now it's a very young crowd. We are very enthusiastic. It's a very nice community because we have no position, so we have nothing to compete with. Uh, so we are very cooperative and very supportive of each other. Um, so in that sense, I agree with you, but there are some signs of flowers uh, blooming uh, in that regard. And, and, and you you weren't talking about economic history, you were talking about history of economics. Well, I was hoping that it would help both. It only helped economic history. I hope the next recession might help us. On a more serious, on a perhaps even more serious note, Mike Munger was here last week, which was, which was fantastic, and he came not only for the lecture, but also for this breakfast about setting up a PPE minor between philosophy, politics, and economics. So I've been teaching in quite a few of those programs in Germany and in Prague, and I think those kinds of programs not standard economics, but economics with some mm -hmm. interfaces to philosophy, to law, to political science, to sociology. Those are also perhaps also more the students who appreciate that. Mm -hmm. So out of those, uh, let's say, oasis type of small programs, you could also get some proliferation into a normal econ department. So I agree with you, I'm skeptical about the econ departments, mm -hmm. but I'm optimistic about those PPE and similar type of, so there is this quite a big network of pluralist economics in Germany, which is quite similar. So out of those fringes of the profession, perhaps, 
you could get some. Mm -hmm. that was okay. Well, that was wonderful as always. So please join me in thank you, Stephen, for, for the. <laughs> As a reminder, there is lunch upstairs if anybody's hungry. And also remember, no program next week for the break. So happy holidays, and we'll see you right after lunch. Thank you. Uh, that was lovely. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts more on uh, what it's like to do primary research.